Hello, my name is Ruben Selvanaigam, Director of International Relations at the Face the Ponta Construction System. And welcome to the second Global Entrepreneurship Week interview focused on housing for the base of the pyramid. Today I'm very pleased to be able to take a broader look at Latin America and the Caribbean with Elkin Velasquez, Director of the UN Habitat Regional Office. And to briefly provide some outline context, it's become well recognized that we're talking about a wide region where an estimated four out of five people live in the city. Such influxes were initiated some decades ago via the poor population population's pursuit of employment, better public services and other amenities. Yet, as was plainly witnessed that with the heavy growth of informal settlements forming on hillsides or floodplains, often located close to heavy traffic, pollution, industrial activity and waste dumps, housing and accompanying infrastructure has not been able to keep pace. Today, given the pervasiveness of poor housing, the modern Latin American and Caribbean city is invariably characterized by widely spread slum communities that surround pockets of formal uh, residential neighborhoods and business districts. Living conditions for the low and in many cases middle classes are largely overcrowded and whilst we have seen some notable improvements in the larger cities, access to clean water, sanitation, reliable energy and broader services such as health and education remains deficient. Nonetheless, there is certainly more hope than ever before for the future and what seems to be a genuine desire by both the public and the private sector to improve the situation. The main debate lies in strategy making whilst addressing the fact that problems have been allowed to accumulate over so many years, in addition to confronting the inherently complex nature of investing within and developing this sector. So Elkin, thank you very much for um, taking the time uh, to speak with us today. Um, perhaps you can start by giving us a brief outline of the work that UN Habitat is principally involved with Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, mentioning some projects or, or case studies that are currently underway. Hello, thank you for this uh, opportunity to, uh, to talk about what we are doing in the region. Uh, UN Habitat is the uh, institution of the UN in charge of uh, supporting member states, countries on sustainable urban development. And in that regard, we have different entry points, like, uh, for instance, working towards better uh, planning and design of those cities, working on uh, better conditions for urban economy uh, and better conditions for youth employment in uh, cities. And also a third pillar important for us is uh, helping countries, helping regions and cities to develop better uh, legislation, better bylaws, so that uh, the sustainable urban development can uh, happen uh, supported by proper, proper um, tools uh, in terms of resources, in terms of uh, uh, legal uh, frameworks. Of course, we also work on uh, particular areas like uh, urban safety, reduction of inequalities, uh, resilience of cities, and uh, a traditional area of work for UN Habitat has been, of course, uh, supporting policies towards uh, better housing solutions for people in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Slum upgrading has been also one of our areas of work. And uh, today, we are much more focused on the prevention of slum formation in cities. So this is in a very, very uh, broad perspective what uh, we are doing in Latin mm -hmm. America and the Caribbean. And uh, of course, uh, we need to adapt every time to what the concrete demand from every country or for a particular city is. Uh, and uh, that's going to give us a result that uh, we have different um, portfolio uh, developments in different countries. You're, you're based in, in Rio de Janeiro. Um, do you have any specific examples perhaps in Rio you could kind of give us some information on? We are uh, indeed based in Rio de Janeiro uh, since the 90s. And um, in Rio de Janeiro we, we operate for the whole region of Latin America and the Caribbean, also for the whole country uh, of Brazil. Uh, in Rio de Janeiro, we, today we have a very specific project on uh, favelas. We are supporting the Instituto Pereira Passos, uh, which belongs to the uh, Prefectura de Rio de Janeiro, uh, in their, one of their flagship programs, the UPP Social. Uh, mm -hmm. UPP Social uh, is about the, uh, the focalization of uh, social policies and the integration and coordination of 
uh, social policies for better delivery in those uh, the private communities. Okay, so I wanted to kind of ask a little bit of a, another broader question, I guess. Looking at initiatives such as the Cities Without Slums, um, Habitat's agenda for agenda goals and principles, commitments to um, the Global Plan for Action, um, which were affirmed at the uh, Rio Plus 20 last year. Do you think that slums and informal housing reduction is genuinely being achieved across the continent? And if so, um, how would you back such an affirmation? First of all, I have to say that the Cities Without Slums was an important kind of slogan and goal in the past. Um, today, what is important for the habitat is the prevention of the formation of slums and the improvement of the quality of life of uh, slum dwellers. Uh, and um, this is not only a, a cosmetic uh, difference. Uh, in some countries, the concept of cities without slums, and I'm not talking about Latin America, has been taken in another way, uh, evictions. And uh, mm -hmm. our point is the what we need to target is slum dwellers and the improvement of the quality of life of those slum dwellers, and improvement of in terms of the access to services, to collective uh, public uh, services, but also to opportunities. And I think that's quite um, an important perspective uh, for for the future. And uh, when I'm talking the future, I'm talking uh, the next uh, global conference, I mean, the tree, uh, mm -hmm. which is going to discuss uh, a new set of, uh, of course, goals and indicators towards better quality of life for uh, urban dwellers and slum dwellers in particular. Yeah, I mean, you know, in the last three years that I've been involved in, in low-income housing, specifically in Brazil, you know, one of the principal strategies that I've seen from my peers has revolved around, you know, slum reforms, and that's principally via infrastructure improvement, you know, improving sanitation, um, waste, water access, energy access, um, but also there's a, a growth of um, housing microfinance, which is basically loans to enable people to increase the size of their homes, improve um, the quality of their homes. Do you think that this is, you know, the kind of prominent st strategy that's going to remain in terms of moving forward? And is, is it the main strategy that UN Habitat and, and you know, the organizations and the institutions that you're involved with are going to commit to? Is that is, is this the kind of principal focus? Our, uh, our main focus is on um, upgrading, the upgrade of uh, slums. And today, what we have learned from the past is that uh, there is a number of things that uh, you need to do, not necessarily at the level or uh, inside the slum, to improve uh, the life of slum dwellers. There mm -hmm. is a lot of things that you can do actually outside the slum, um, improving the quality of uh, services for, for mm -hmm. I mean, in a city-wide perspective, but also improving the quality of delivery of institutions and. Uh, of course, uh, things like uh, improving the the quality of the planning and design, for example, for uh, re-urbanize, for uh, recover some uh, degraded uh, areas. Mm -hmm. uh, so at this very moment, I would say that uh, beyond the specific uh, or the specificity of uh, some traditional tools for housing, uh, what we think is, is that we need to look at the city in a very comprehensive and integrated uh, manner. And we need to understand that there is a lot of decisions, there is a lot of good actions, uh, initiatives that uh, needs to be taken at the level of, of the city as a whole, uh, precisely to have a positive impact in, in the life of uh, Islam dwellers. So I, I really think, we really think as you inhabit that, that of course, we need to continue working on the, on specific programs like uh, microfinances for for uh, for specific group of of uh, slum dwellers. Uh, mm -hmm. Today, our focus is much more in in the big picture, and we do think that in that way we we, we will be contributing both to uh, improve the quality of life of the slum dwellers that we have today, but most importantly to prevent the formation of new slums uh, in the world. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a question that I was going to come to, um, this last point you just made. 
in relation to you know this 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 strategy that seems to be at the forefront of most um, you know institutions such as UN Habitat and most kind of private sector you know interests in the base of the pyramid housing sector, and I think you know the main reason that 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 has kind of emerged is that most people um, who live in kind of the central urban settings are reluctant to leave you know they don't want to move to um, peripheral housing for example I was, I was about to quote something that the TED speaker Robert Newworth said that um, no government no developer no Donald Trump out there is going to be able to build for people at a price that they can afford um, referring to informal community residents in a very pragmatic way these slums represent the urban neighborhoods of the future so it seems to me that you know the strategy has kind of overtaken any kind of uh, notion of, of rehousing people that live in slums it's, it's mainly focused towards improving slum conditions that's happened quite a lot in, in Rio de Janeiro for example there's been a number of kind of infrastructure improvements 1.6 billion reais I think is going to be invested in Hosinha for example um, you know the pacification programs that have been happening for the last couple of years you know they've they've had an impact so I wanted to talk about you know the, the the sustainability of these of these kind of strategies. Um, and one thing that I've noticed in kind of the work I do uh, in housing is that the problem with um, a lot of projects that are happening, you know, these infrastructure projects, etc., is that they're leading to kind of a, an issue of speculation because. What's happening is, is, as I mentioned, a lot of people are not are reluctant to move out of the, the central urban areas. But then what happens is that people um, crowd into kind of small spaces um, and, you know, and populations increase in places like Rio de Janeiro, which leads to a, a situation of speculation. And this is often exacerbated by a lack of policy control. Um, you know, for, for urban growth. So I wondered what kind of mitigation strategies are being built um, within UN Habitat's policy making to kind of counteract this or, 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 you know, kind of move forward against this. Because to, to quote some examples, the Getulio Vargas Foundation um, estimated that rents in favelas like Hosinha have increased 6.8% more than the formal neighborhoods of Rio de Janeiro. Um, so you've got people renting nine meters squared of, of space for absurd levels of, of rent because they simply don't want to move out of the city because they work there, they've got their families there, and you know for fully understandable reasons. But then you've got this issue of urban populations moving to the city to you know attract it to work. And you know in the next few years, regions like Rio de Janeiro obviously can become more attractive because you know you've got the World Cup, you've got the Olympics. Uh, so all these cities are growing in terms of um, urban populations. So I just wonder what kind of mitigation strategies uh, are being put in place. Uh, from your uh, interesting statement, long statement, you are, of course, putting on the table very important uh, points, uh, at least a point on, on location of uh, people, a point on housing uh, solutions and uh, the location of housing solutions. And you are also talking about uh, the how to control somehow uh, the immigration to the city or the density uh, in the city. On these mm -hmm. three points, let me say uh, what uh, we think we are promoting as uh, UN Habitat. First of all, uh, and that's from, from experience. First, uh, first of all, one example. We were working, uh, we were supporting a process of, of relocation of slum dwellers in Medellin in Colombia some years mm -hmm. ago. And the people, of course, in the private, uh, the, the, the private uh, area, but very well located. And people told uh, to the municipality, you can do, uh, you can propose us whatever you want. The only thing you cannot propose us is to go far from here. Why was that? Uh, it was not just because of an attachment to, to the space, that uh, urban space. It, it was for very practical reasons. And the practical reasons was uh, proximity to job opportunities. Mm -hmm. But we are, that's a, a concrete example, and Medellin did it very well. They did the um, upgrading, the regeneration of this uh, poor neighborhood, uh, including the variable of uh, keeping people in the same place, and of course, uh, with a lot of participation of, of uh, the community in the design of this. And uh, down the road, uh, this uh, model became, uh, or this process became 
something uh, globally interesting and that this city was I think uh, yeah. last year or this year the price as the most uh, socially innovative uh, place I mean city of the year on the other side on the other end what you have is the example of uh, Mexican uh, housing policy in Mexico for a while the decision was to build houses in uh, cheap land far from downtowns and uh, the new government is uh, now calling to you inhabitant uh, for help for support to give, to find a solution to this problem they developed a very very uh, they developed uh, urban sprawl uh, and uh, is becoming inefficient and uh, not only from an economic perspective but from an environmental perspective and from a social perspective one of our recent uh, uh, analysis actually just to taking um, official data from Mexico is that in Mexico there is 3.9 uh, empty new units new mm -hmm. houses so in the periphery yeah. exactly and why was that because they were far from uh, jobs opportunity so for people uh, is more the most important asset now is becoming proximity to uh, to places where uh, jobs are emerging uh, from places where services are being provided, including, including, uh, including social services. Uh, the conclusion of this is that uh, as if you were asking for advice to uh, buy real estate in, uh, in New York and you would uh, receive um, the advice of uh, the most important variable is location and the second one is location and the third one is location I would say that uh, uh, the advice to cities that want to reduce inequalities is the same if you want to reduce inequalities and uh, spa uh, spatial in injustice in cities the most important thing is location location and location you need mm -hmm. really to think that the city has to offer good locations to poor people otherwise you are uh, probably uh, in an indirect way inducing uh, more inequalities and uh, spatial injustice so it's really extremely important so you have to build the the city of the future in the solutions to slums thinking about uh, uh, this uh, point uh, location a second point or a second um, uh, yes point entry point that you mentioned was uh, the price for housing and I think of course this is a critical part of this equation if you go if you want to stay near downtown or near the centralities of the city uh, you might imagine that uh, the price of land in, is going to increase and uh, mm. developers uh, social and or private developers will tell you this is a very important factor uh, when calculating the the final cost of uh, houses and uh, this is more or less uh, true but it doesn't mean that uh, you need to push out of the of the city uh, the poor and uh, there is very very uh, interesting tools to deal with this uh, situation and of course we need regulation we need regulation we need uh, in some countries probably new legislation so so as to be able to um, utilize key variables like edificability I mean buildability in English uh, you can utilize this in order to provide including uh, private developers with the possibility to uh, increase the number of stories but provided they uh, build uh, affordable house for low-income uh, families there is a solution in that regard but there is other solutions and I'm just coming from the meeting where ministers of housing and urban development from the region Latin America and the Caribbean were discussing that in this region we are still or we have potential to develop other policies like for instance um, subsidizing um, uh, rent uh, people uh, instead of ownership of houses subsidizing mm -hmm. uh, renting mm -hmm. so that people can 
really make a choice in terms of locations without being worried uh, for uh, this uh, affordability uh, problem. So there is there is a solutions. The important uh, thing is when we need to think about housing solutions, location is is very important, and we cannot just uh, think that uh, uh, poor people have to live far from downtown. That's the wrong way. Yeah. You mentioned it other points, and the, the point you mentioned it is about density. Um, I probably have uh, bad news. Density is going to uh, increase if, I mean, should we want a, a sustainable uh, planet, mm -hmm. we need to increase density in cities. And uh, of course, there is still people and uh, organizations and institutions promoting uh, other models of development, of uh, urban development, different or not taking into consideration uh, a sustainable uh, density. Um, uh, as you inhabit it, we think that sustainable development is very much related with uh, building compact cities. And building compact cities, of course, under a certain number of uh, criteria and that are going to provide this sustainability mm -hmm. is is really uh, is not going to work if uh, if if uh, policies are going to be developed to stop the migration of uh, people towards cities. This is not going to work because, as I said before, people are uh, going behind jobs and jobs are being created in cities. Even in China, probably you you know about the hukou the hukou uh, system where people were um, were not allowed to move from a city to another one or a hmm. province to another one, uh, and I mean by 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 the law, and uh, even the Chinese uh, government, the new Chinese government is reviewing this uh, policy, and they know hmm. that this instrument is is not working in a city like uh, Shenzhen. Uh, nine million inhabitants. They had at least uh, one million uh, irregular people. I mean, uh, despite, of, right. despite of 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 the hukou uh, system, and of course, as you are saying, having regular housing. So now they are seeing things in another way. Of course, compactness in a city comes with uh, a number of of uh, needs. You need regulation so that. Uh, uh, you can't really develop a, a, a sustainable density pattern. You need good planning. You need good design so that we are able to uh, to live together, isn't it? In 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 uh, small spaces, you need good uh, transportation. You need uh, a number of things happening in, in cities. And then, of course, for continents like uh, the African continent, like some areas in. Asia, where they are 30% urbanized in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, or 50% urbanized in, in Asia, in average. Um, you think ahead, you plan ahead, and uh, you anticipate the expansion areas for cities. In Latin mm -hmm. America, what you need is to go uh, for regeneration of uh, areas. And yeah. uh, you are, of course, talking about uh, one of the challenges. How uh, how to avoid gentrification? This is the, the I think the the concept. How to avoid that uh, the poor people uh, living in a place are going to be displaced by uh, newcomers? I would say that what we need to expect is that uh, the, w while the economy level, the economic level of a, a neighborhood is going to improve over time, you will uh, see, you should see. Uh, you should be able to see as well that the economic situation of uh, the dwellers in that neighborhood is going also to increase. That might happen yeah, if, you are able, if you if you are able to uh, to design proper policies. Mm, uh, mm. And proper policies is comp uh, pro uh, a policy towards compact city, but also mixed uh, uses, so that people can not do not need to spend. Uh, a lot of, or a very important part of their uh, income in transportation. They're integrated into society, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Okay. And, yeah. and final point, 
uh, you need also to articulate, and that's, let me say, difficult, uh, articulate the social policy with the urban policy in the economic policy. You need really to have this integrated to, to obtain this result. Good news is that mm. the places that are doing this uh, are showing that uh, it works. Right. And what kind of places are they, sorry? What kind of examples do you have of, of that kind of policy working? I have, you, you can see um, examples at uh, different uh, scales, small, small scale I can uh, mention, and uh, I'm sorry for that, uh, an initiative that was done, promoted by the UN system, I mean the one UN by the three agencies, we were part of it, in El Salvador and at small scale in a neighborhood we were able to show in a pilot case that combining housing policies, design, economic policies and social policies, we were able to uh, make in the neighborhood, uh, uh, that the neighborhood could improve at the same time and more or less at the same pace that uh, uh, people uh, economic uh, situation were improving. So that's mm -hmm. a small scale. Uh, we were talking about the Medellin model at least for this particular case of the um, north uh, eastern part of, of the city that was working. But if you look m much more um, bigger examples, let me mention uh, Manhattan. Uh, Manhattan started just with um, a, the layout of a city, isn't it? At the time, uh, 1811, uh, where there was no electricity, no mm. buildings, uh, and then over the years, the same uh, planned city has been able to go through the different economic cycles and to to thrive, isn't it? Yeah. Or let's go to Barcelona, much more. Uh, I mean, closer to the Latin uh, world you see that the decision made in the uh, mid-19th century about a very particular way to design the city, uh, an expansion of the city, an expansion for a population five times more than the population of Barcelona at that time, at that moment, uh, was successful uh, mm -hmm. down the road. So you have a different scale examples, of course, an example, you know yeah. that, we know that because we have a very important uh, program on on uh, best practices. We know that uh, you cannot copy and paste automatically, but at least you can inspire other yeah. situations uh, mm. based on uh, what uh, has uh, worked well in, in other uh, contexts, in other geographies, and in other uh, times. Yeah, I think that's a that's an interesting point. It reminds me of um, of the situation in London. Um, you know, London a century ago, the central parts of London were were very derelict. You know, they were similar kind of you know similar kind of picture to what you just stated in Manhattan. And it's interesting over you know the post-war years how things developed. To go back to your point in relation to location and um, you know constructors wanting to work in the sector, I think. My own experience of, of you know of, of being involved with low-income housing, more and more developers um, are kind of moving away from low-income housing. The reason for that is is simply because even though we all know that you know the point you mentioned before is that it's very important for people at the base of the pyramid, low-income groups, to be close to the city. It's a difficult situation because land close to the city is, is simply not cheap and it's simply not viable enough for developers to, to construct there because obviously developers want to make a margin and if they construct closer to the city centre, they're not going to achieve what they, what they hope to. Um, and you know, if you apply projects, um, programs like um, Mia Casa Mia Vida here in Brazil, you know, with the limits that are set, um, you know, the margins are, are limited even further. Um, and then you've got other factors that come into play, such as you know the construction costs. Um, I was doing a bit of research today, um, and I just saw that in in, Colum in Venezuela, construction costs have increased by 55% this year. Brazil, albeit at a much lower pace, they're still increasing. 
there's there's very little interest in 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 developing you know i'm talking about c traditional construction methodologies you know the bricks and mortar kind of strategies so um i think we we've got a bit of a situation here where um a bit of a polarized polarized situation whereby you've got one side of the uh, of of the the camp kind of saying okay well let's kind of develop within um, the favelas. Let's try and improve the favelas, whereby we improve the situation and we um, improve infrastructure. For example, we can make sure that all the residents have um, adequate water, adequate energy, adequate sanitation. Then you've got the other end of the of, of this polarized kind of image, which is um, you know this new housing policy, whereby the only housing that's being built is being built. At distances, you know, distant from the periphery. There's no other option. You know, we saw, for example, in Brazil, um, July this year, that that was one of the reasons why the manifestations kicked off because people were complaining about the fact that they weren't close to their places of work. They were travelling two hours every day, and this is not just in the bigger cities. It's happening more and more in in the kind of medium-sized cities as well. So um, I just wondered what kind of what your kind of thoughts were. You know, you mentioned legislation and policy making. Um, what kind of strategy has been found to kind of uh, you know kind of being formulated to kind of find this middle ground i i do agree with uh, your first uh, statement it's not easy uh, you know uh, the, and i would add uh, building affordable houses in uh, central places is not uh, easy for developers under the current model of urbanization what is it the current model of urbanization is a model that uh, is um, giving priority to the car. It's giving prior priority to cars and there is mm. some component of this uh, model that has been is the prevalent model for the last uh, 50 to 60 years is a model that uh, uh, is about zoning. So you have you know big plots uh, or big uh, areas uh, in a map in a in a city that you are going to dedicate to uh, unique uh, land uses. So uh, there is uh, some uh, polygons only for social housing, other polygons only for uh, business uh, infrastructures, others uh, for entertainment, uh, for mm. industrial areas, and so on. So mm. that's that is wrong. Uh, that's what we are advocating uh, as a UN Habitat. That model of, of zoning is wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we are advocating for is for the mixed uses, uh, the mixed uh, uh, neighborhood where you have residential areas, but you have also commercial areas, services areas, some low uh, impact uh, transformative uh, in industries. And with the idea that it it has to work as a as a system as a whole, and the most important impact you you reduce you can reduce the number of travels and the utilization of the car. Uh, so uh, yes, in the prevalent uh, model, uh, it's difficult for developers to think different to what they have been uh, doing. What they have been doing is they have been uh, allocated, uh, they have been uh, seeing uh, areas of the city in, I mean, far from centers allocated for social housing, and uh, you see that they usually are um, solutions that are one size fits all, the same, homogeneous, and uh, mm. it means that uh, it's uh, an easy to do uh, business. It's a kind of a five-year cycle financial uh, nice business. And yeah. um, uh, but doing this, and, and I'm not against that. On on the contrary, we need that the private sector and uh, you know, and, and different uh, economic sectors in a city, in a country, can really advance, can thrive, can can be developed. But it yeah. can be sustainable. And uh, there is a reason uh, I was mentioning the model. The model has been built mainly from. A uh, financial perspective, and uh, once again, uh, in Mexico, you can find these uh, examples mm -hmm. uh, at scale, actually. Mm -hmm. And what we need really is to to go towards another model of urbanization, a model of urbanization that is going to uh, to, to promote uh, density. Second, that is going to promote uh, mixed land uses but also that is going to promote diversity 
and the mm. mixity of of uh, social groups. Uh, yeah. Also, some researches in the region are showing that uh, when you have homogeneous population in a neighborhood, uh, this neighborhood it becomes a conflict-prone neighborhood. This yeah, is that's for sure. So we need we need uh, this kind of uh, of uh, diversity, and we are mm. promoting that. We are also promoting uh, avoiding as much as possible. Uh, zoning, the traditional zoning. Of course, if, mm. if it is about a nuclear plant, you need specific uh, area for that. But mm. uh, that's the, you know, the 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 exception uh, to the rule. So, yeah. uh, what uh, we think in terms of uh, policy is that uh, the policies that uh, we need to promote in a country, uh, national urban policies, for instance, should be policies under this new urbanization model. Good news is that uh, we are not the only ones thinking about that. People from environment are now realizing that uh, in climate change that uh, actually the the current urbanization model is impacting very strongly uh, uh, climate change actually and is not mm -hmm. sustainable. And uh, can you imagine that uh, we are going to double the urban population in the next uh, 30 to 40 years? We yeah. will go from uh, 3 billion to 6 billion. So can and you look at what the situation is now, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So we need really a strong change and, uh, of, of model, a shift of, of the uh, urbanization model. Uh, the other interesting point is that the private sector is also real, uh, realizing, I would say, in an aggregated manner that it's not good to have um, uh, five million, you know, um, empty houses in a country <laughs> of, uh, ha of 100 million people. You know, the, the economic development uh, people, thinkers, leaders are now realizing that this is not sustainable. Even if there is one private developer that is uh, getting some, some, uh, I mean, that is earning well his uh, life, is not mm. sustainable for the rest of the economy because all yeah. the assets of a country are going, uh, I mean, are being dilapidated somehow. So yeah. there is a number of entry points that are, uh, I would say, converging towards really a new way of conceiving uh, uh, cities and, uh, and solutions in cities. And I think this can be summarized in, in one uh, kind of, of uh, sentence is we would need to go from building houses to building cities. And building cities mm -hmm. is a much uh, longer term uh, business, but it's a longer term business where uh, actually we can all win, including private sector, and a lot of money. Because by the way, there is uh, two ways to, to look at uh, uh, this. I mean, economists uh, can uh, say that uh, when you do what I am explaining, you will develop economies of agglomeration. And economies mm -hmm. of agglomeration uh, means innovation. And uh, because there is much more people. It's crowded, yes, but it's, if it is crowded of, of, in, in a nice urban environment, we will exchange ideas and we will create and we will become innovative and it's not uh, even habit of we saying that it's economists of uh, innovation. And uh, mm -hmm. there is an, a number of places uh, showing this this uh, evolution. Yeah, I mean, I was going to come to um, I was going to come to the issue of, of innovation shortly. You know, the point you made about zoning is quite interesting. Looking here in Brazil, um, you know, there's there's zones of urban interest they're called, um, and um, you know the land prices in these regions have just gone to the, you know, just gone through the roof, you know, they're the same kind of levels oh, yeah. as, as what, you know, you would pay for in, a, in, a, in an upper class region, you know, because there's been no kind of policy to kind of control um, the speculation within them. Like just to, to, to say that uh, it's a matter of regulation. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I know, I know the, the phenomena you are talking about and uh, yes, it's a matter of regulation, and uh, regulation matters are not easy, are multidimensional, and uh, you you cannot expect that the only one public policy instrument is going to, to to provide a solution. You need really to build something that is a policy that uh, is multidimensional, that, that takes into consideration the different uh, dimensions of, of the problem. Absolutely. Um, but I, I would like just to 
to bring to the table that are something that is being proposed by ministers of uh, housing and urban development in the region is to develop much more uh, uh, subsidies to to renting to rent houses and I think that's something that is uh, underdeveloped in uh, Latin America uh, uh, contrary to what uh, we know in Europe and mm. we know that uh, uh, this can be a complementary tool um, I'm not saying that it's going to be the solution but we need really to to utilize much more diverse um, diverse uh, tools uh, towards the, the regulation that uh, yes can uh, can support, uh, I would say, that uh, a situation where the real, actual economy of a place uh, can uh, can be what it is, and and we try to avoid as much as possible speculations. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, I think the the importance as well is for um, construction companies to not compromise their quality standards just because they're you know building to to towards low income groups as well. You know, I think it's important that. Um, Okay, we're going to be catering to the low-income groups with, you know, this kind of idea of um, um, social urbanism. But it's not a case of saying, okay, well, if we're going to create the low-income housing for low-income groups, we've got to kind of compromise our quality standards. Um, the subsidising rent is, is, you know, uh, definitely a an interesting idea. Um, I guess that there has been an, an aspect of that. Um, in operation in Brazil in relation to the residential leasing program where the housing has kind of been given to, to, to low income groups on a, on a lease basis so they pay 5% of their income over um, over the term of the of the finance contract um, and then at the end they, they have the option to purchase the home but then you know with that goes back to the, the other point that I made earlier in relation to the cities that have been placed on the on the maximum price that's been paid to the construction company so that's limiting prof profitability so I think um, there's a question there in relation to kind of how we achieve this balance of maintaining good quality standards for the low income groups whilst um, enabling yes, and, them to be... Uh, I would add quality. that uh, there is also um, an issue of uh, governance uh, and I think when you go to Santiago de Chile you will find the interest of having a good metropolitan governance because you have 28 municipalities, each one of them with its own housing policy and housing policies in a very divergent uh, way and there is no, I would say, coherent response to a problem that is uh, actually uh, uh, is a continuum, the problem of, of a deficit of uh, housing in the Santiago de Chile metropolitan area. So there is mm. also something that uh, we need to, to see is a kind of harmonization of public policies, complementarity of public policies in uh, across municipalities and I think in uh, Brazil mm -hmm. is also uh, an imp a, a point that needs to be taken taken into account when you look at uh, Rio uh, Metro Metropolitan Rio Metropolitan Sao Paulo Metropolitan uh, Brasilia and so on so I, I would add to mm -hmm. what you were saying that uh, this is an important point that needs yeah. to be taken into consideration yeah I think I think that the public policy that you mentioned as well needs to embrace um, a lot more the private sector. I think there's a, a huge divide in what's actually happening between um, you know the private and the public sector. You know, there's not enough analysis of what the private sector needs to do to be able to find viability um, and to be able to formulate business models that work within the market. Um, I think the public sector would look at kind of deficit levels. Um, you know, what's actually needed in 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 different regions, which is obviously need necessary. But I think there needs to be a lot more interaction with the with the private sector. Um, yeah, just one last um, one last question um, in terms of you know what you what you mentioned previously. I just wondered if you thought there was um, enough innovation happening within the sector in terms of both technical um, engineering development as well as uh, mechanisms that embrace um, you know bringing down costs. So you know cost reductions can be subsequently transferred to you know the the, the market in a, in the form of affordable prices, um, as well as the environment. You know we mentioned. Um, you know the importance of environmental sustainability when we're when we're thinking about urbanisation. Um, so I just wondered, you know, if you think there is enough innovation happening uh, in, in the marketplace. Um, I'm afraid that uh, I have to say no. That uh, what we are uh, seeing is uh, business as usual, and the result is there. I mean, uh, the cities we are building in Latin America, you can see every time 
we we go uh, once again to a city that we already know. Uh, usually, we say there is more congestion, there is there is more pollution, there is more uh, negative externalities. Actually, it means that uh, there is no innovation in business as, as usual. Uh, despite all what uh, we we can say and talk uh, with uh, our counterparts, um, is is prevailing. Mm. Uh, of course, not everything is bad news and. Uh, uh, for us, when we see that um, our government, federal government, mm -hmm. like the Mexican one, in, in Pe Enrique Peña Nieto's president, is saying we need to change, we need to change the model, and that they are now putting in place a new national um, urban development policy and housing policy towards more compact cities and including, of course, new financial instruments and incentives to mm. private sector to build uh, not only far away from the from downtown, but also trying to enter into the retrofitting, into the regeneration of uh, uh, already existing neighborhoods, and mm -hmm. including the variable of uh, uh, producing uh, also social housing, but uh, social housing uh, embedded into the regeneration, not just the big blocks of uh, uh, thousands of uh, social housing solutions uh, mm -hmm. all the same, but uh, something much more, uh, I would say, integrated to the urban landscape. This holistic, is, yeah. yeah. Uh, exactly. Uh, I'm also optimistic and I, I, I think we, we can have hope when uh, you discuss with Brazilian counterparts and they say it is important not what we have done with all uh, the, the social policy instruments that uh, has been able or has allowed this country to uh, bring back from, I mean, out of poverty 40 million people in, in, uh, in just uh, a decade. I think that's important, and, but they, they are also saying uh, now we need really to see how we can add urban value to our social policy. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, what I understand is that uh, they have the question in mind that uh, they also need to utilize, or if you want to continue doing social policy, but thinking uh, the city, thinking yeah. how the city is planned, uh, thinking how some criteria towards better uh, city life are uh, applied. The experiences uh, in Medellin that we know, by the way, I think it was people in Medellin who put on the uh, market of concepts the idea of social urbanism. I think they are doing uh, also something interesting. They, they are far from, from a perfect situation, but they are showing some, some uh, ways ahead. Uh, what we were mentioning in El Salvador, I, it comes now also to my mind what um, at some point um, Tito did in, uh, to recover uh, downtown. Um, I mean the, the historic uh, historic uh, center. Uh, if you go to Panama City, there was also a very very interesting uh, regeneration project uh, of a slum exactly in the in the center uh, of uh, Panama City. So the good news is that there is some experiences here and then that um, uh, yeah, from, yeah. Am yeah amazingly are not you know, uh, do not belong to a particular um, uh, uh, political wing or ideology, but are just a common sense about what the the good city needs to be. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, and I would say, and I, I think this is uh, something interesting from our practice and, and work with uh, partners. We were working with the city of Medellin, and I told to one of the previous mayor. Uh, Major, congratulations for what uh, you are doing. And uh, in a very humble way, he told me, uh, Elkin, what we are doing is the result of of compiling and integrating a number of different experiences that uh, uh, Latin American cities have developed over the past mm. uh, 15 years. Yeah. And he started to tell the story, starting from Curitiba in, in Brazil, what uh, Jaime Lerner did. And then he went to Quito and he mentioned it, uh, Peñalosa in Bogota and uh, he mentioned it also uh, another example in, 
in Buenos Aires, in, in Argentina. So I do think, and that's, uh, I think, a, a very positive note to conclude my intervention also with the spirit of the UN, is that there is really hope because there is innovations. Uh, mm. There is really hope because people are are able to learn from, from others' experiences um, and uh, others' uh, lessons learned. And, and mistakes, also, yeah. yeah. Exactly, mm. and there is also uh, hope because actually uh, evidence is showing people and we are much more senti sensitized as a Latin American society in that regard that if we do not change our uh, model of, uh, of uh, developing cities, um, we will be in serious troubles uh, in the future. Mm. Yeah, um, you know, just to kind of back that up in in terms of you know experiences that are happening in in Brazil, I think you know with um, the problems that have occurred with the implementation of the Minha Casa and Minha Vida, and you know similar to to what's you know been happening in Mexico, um, developments being created um, very distant from you know the the, the kind of urban setting. Um, you know now I've, I've noticed that. Um, Kaish Economic Affairs, how are the, the financial administrators? They, they've kind of taken a stricter approach in terms of approving projects. So I think, you know, at the top, at the decision making level, um, a lot of more controls can be made in relation to accepting projects and, you know, granting projects. I think there needs to be a lot more control to make sure that, you know, the projects that are authorized are genuinely sustainable. Uh, yeah, um, I just wondered if there's any kind of events or talks or any kind of information that you want to kind of relay to, uh, to the listeners today. You know what's coming up, or what can be expected from um, UN Habitat that you wanted to kind of uh, let everyone know about. Uh, definitely. So, thank you for this invitation to invite uh, to invite people to uh, attend the next World Urban Forum. You know, we are going to organize the seventh uh, World Urban Forum, and this time it's in Medellin, Colombia, and this is fifth uh, to eleventh uh, April next year. Mm -hmm. we, we are expecting 10,000 uh, people, uh, including uh, national authorities, local authorities, experts, uh, planners, social urbanists, uh, or urban sociologists. We are expecting private sector. We are expecting, um, of course, uh, NGOs and uh, citizens from uh, all over the world. And I think this is really the place to be. Uh, and, and to be ready to, in order to capture the last uh, developments and innovations on uh, urban development. Excellent, excellent. And I guess more information can be found on the uh, the UN Habitat uh, Latin yes. American Caribbean website about that and other. Oh, the, the Latin American the Caribbean and the global uh, website, which is www.unhabitat.org. Excellent, Elkeen. Um, well, thank you very much for your time, and look forward to, um, to to publishing this interview and 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 hopefully keeping in touch. Thank you, Roland. Thank you for your time and uh, and for your call. Thank you very much.